Lovely to see you all here in person. A very warm welcome. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. So welcome back. Um, I'm Karen Taylor. I am Programme Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And as I mentioned, I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's talk, which is the first in our 2022 season. Um, and we have a real special treat for you this evening. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1785, 237 years ago. Uh, today, our organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of New York City through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition free Mechanics Institute. Um, our John M. Mossman Locke Museum, for those of you who are here in person, I'm gonna indicate it's upstairs. And for those of you who are joining us online, I hope at some point in the future, you'll be able to visit the museum and indeed the General Society, Society Library of, of course, of which tonight's lecture is taking place. Um, and finally, um, our final educational program is our General Society Lecture Series of which tonight is part of. And we are, um, we are getting close to having uh, had public lectures for nearly 200 years. Clearly I haven't been here for all of them. <laughs> Throughout tonight's talk, we'll take, um, sorry, I should say uh, tonight's talk, for those of you online, you please film, free to submit a question online at any point. Uh, for our audience in person, we'll ask uh, that you hold off questions until the very end. Um, and again, for those of you who are online, we ask that you use the Q&A section rather than raise your hand. Now tonight, as I mentioned, we have something very special. I'm so pleased to welcome back Michael Visconti, who's organized tonight's program, and will introduce our second speaker. Um, Michael is going to say something, but I do want to mention this fabulous book by Thomas Hines is for sale tonight, and it's absolutely a treasure. Wait till you see the beautiful illustration throughout, and of course, the text is pretty good as well. So I want to mention, uh, Tom will be send, uh, signing books at the end of the evening. I also want to mention uh, that there was a lovely piece tonight about in the New York Times, in the New York Times, uh, New York Today column by James Barron this morning, uh, who, who filled in a few details um, about alligators. But of course, Michael is going to add many more. Uh, Michael Moscone served as the Manhattan Borough President historian. <laughs> yes, oh yeah, that was, that's a vital word. <laughs> Um, from 2006 to 2019, he is a native New Yorker, a professional tour guide, and an historical activist. Michael, I'm so pleased to introduce you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, what a pleasure it is tonight, and it has always been to speak here at the General Society. Uh, unfortunately, you folks at home cannot see this glorious space that we are in. So I always encourage people uh, to come here and check it out in person, the General Society Library. Before I get started, I wanna thank some people, certainly Karen, thank you so much. Victoria, who runs the organization. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> Uh, behind the scenes, I want to thank Angelo and Meg and everybody else in this army of supporters who are making tonight's presentation possible. And yes, we have a double header tonight. We will be uh, doing an interview. I will be doing an interview with uh, the author of Wild City, Tom Hines, uh, after the presentation I begin with. Uh, this is a celebration and part of an annual celebration of Alligator in the Sewer Day. Uh, which is something, a tradition I began back in 2010, more about that later. Uh, it is a celebration of what I consider New York City's greatest true-ish urban legend. 
Uh, and you'll see why it's a true-ish urban legend, not false and not entirely true. So let's, let's begin uh, with the history of alligators in the New York City area and in sewers particular, in particular. The first documented case I have found of an alligator sighting in what is today the five borough New York City occurred back in 1877. Here's a clipping I found in the New York Herald, June of 1877, uh, titled, Is He a Native? While a number of workmen were digging a sewer in the vicinity of Brook Avenue and Southern Boulevard, that's 133rd Street, they discovered in Millbrook uh, a live alligator measuring four feet. The Saurian, I love that word, Saurian, was secured and is now sporting in a tank provided by the contractors. How the alligator got into these regions is a mystery to everyone. And part of that mystery we will try to delve into uh, in this presentation. So where did this happen? Well, at the time it was lower Westchester County, uh, but that portion uh, would be eventually absorbed into the city of New York. So basically it's the South Bronx today's South Bronx. Here's a, a map that shows you that area from approximately this time. This is from 1873. The red arrow shows you the intersection. Uh, and there's a sort of a, a darkish squiggle that runs up and down. That's what was called Millbrook, AKA Morris Brook, went by the two different names. And um, I decided, you know, let me uh, see what, what's there today. So I took a little visit and uh, no, no remnants of the Millbrook exist at Bruckner Avenue and Brook Ave Bruckner Boulevard and Brook Avenue, which is the location of this sighting. I thought I'd go to the car wash and see if they saw any alligators, but I thought better of it and decided not to. Now, a point I want to make here is that alligators in the New York City metropolitan region are rare, but they are not unheard of. There have been sightings uh, in addition to this one. And in the 1930s in particular, there was a rash of sightings, right? So here are three examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, an alligator was found in the New York City subway system. An alligator was, two alligators were located in, uh, uh, Bron in I'm sorry, the Bronx River. Uh, north of the city, but nonetheless quite close. And uh, this lovely, wonderful, amazing picture shows an alligator that was cap captured by a barge captain on the East River. Some boys noticed the thing sort of swimming nearby and they screamed and hollered and this barge captain went over and lassoed the thing, right? Uh, and there's his, uh, his prey. And he, of course, decided to keep it as a pet or so it claimed in the article. Now, the pivotal sighting, the one that has really sparked internationally the urban legend of there being alligators in New York City sewer system also happened in the 1930s. And it occurred in East Harlem. And to be exactly particular, it was East 123rd Street. Uh, East Harlem has changed quite a bit since the mid-1930s. At the time, it was solidly Italian-American. On a February day, February 9th to be exact, uh, there was snow on the ground. A bunch of boys were hanging around, kind of bored. They noticed that the snow was piled up and that uh, looked kind of trashy. And they decided, you know what? Let's clean things up a little bit. Let's shovel some of this snow. So what they did... They opened up a nearby manhole cover and proceeded to shovel snow into the manhole, right? Well, what did they discover in the manhole? An alligator, a real live alligator. Now, how do we know that this actually took place? Well, it was covered in three local newspapers independently, okay? And you see two of the listings, two of the... Um, uh, clippings of those papers, the New York Herald Tribune and the New York Times both covered uh, this sighting. And so let me let them speak for how things proceeded. Uh, I thought, I think frankly, the New York Herald Tribune story is the best one, the, the best written one. So we'll start with that one. So the boys noticed this alligator below and 
quoting from the article, it's an alligator, cried James Mitreno. Salvatore threw down his shovel and raced into the house where he managed to snatch his mother's clothesline from its hook without arousing parental suspicion. Salvatore wanted the alligator, just why he could not explain, but the urge to capture the creature was upon him and was irresistible. Clutching his lasso, he swung himself down into the manhole, landing astride the denizen of the place, which upon contact, he was certain was an alligator. He slipped the noose over the reptile's head, drew it taut and hoisted it to the street and, and was hoisted to the street by his companions, the end of the clothesline in his hand. The three boys grasped the rope and hauled to East 123rd Street, a veritable alligator, eight feet long. Let's go to the times now. Slowly with its curving tail twisting weakly, the animal was dragged from the snow 10 feet through the dank cavern and to the street where it lay non-committal. I love that line, where it lay non-committal. It was not in Florida, that was clear. And therefore, when one of the boys sought to loosen the rope, the creature opened its jaws and snapped, not with the robust vigor of a healthy, well-sunned alligator, but with the fury of a sick, very badly treated one. The boys jumped back. Curiosity and sympathy turned to enmity. Let them have it, the cry went up. Uh, this story does not have a happy ending, especially uh, for the alligators. Uh, they had shovels in hand, and so they proceeded to beat the poor animal and eventually killed it. Triumphantly, but not without the inevitable reaction of sorrow, the boys took their victim to the Lehigh Stove and Repair Shop, where it was found to weigh 125 pounds. They said it measured seven and a half or eight feet. It became at once the greatest attraction the store ever had had. Now, in my research for this urban legend, it always was in the back of my head that, you know, as a historian, you always got to treat newspaper accounts, especially old newspaper accounts, with a bit of salt. It, it, it wasn't incredibly uncommon for reporters to make stuff up or to perhaps even be bamboozled by people who were trying to sell them a bit of goods. Now, uh, and, and I really had the suspicion when I had only found one of these articles, it was the New York Times. That's the one that everybody quoted. That's the one that everybody relied on. Then I discovered the Herald Tribune article and I realized, okay, well, that's another, another uh, 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 factor in the, the truth of this. And then I dug even deeper and I found the daily news coverage of this event. Now, those of you old time New Yorkers like me will remember that the Daily News was New York's picture newspaper. Remember that? They proudly uh, put that on their banner. And sure enough, they ran a story with an illustration. And that was the clincher. This thing really happened, right? Um, it, was not, it was not a hoax, it was not a legend, it was reality. The story was carried on the wire services. So I've turned up, uh, you know, basically excerpt of the account in other cities across the country and even in Canada. So you can say that this story spread internationally and it gave, it gave the spark to what many, many New Yorkers have heard since their youth that there are alligators living in the New York City sewer system. So, where do these alligators come from, right? Well, there are some theories mentioned in the articles and proposed by various pundits. And there are, I've collected the four. So A, they migrated here naturally. Uh, it is said that alligators would range as far as the area around here in the uh, warm weather months, I don't know, how credible that is, especially, I don't know how long they would survive <laughs> getting, make, migrating up from wherever they're coming from. So uh, maybe, maybe a couple have managed to come here that way. Uh, another theory uh, postulated in the Times article is they were tossed from ships 
that had come from the tropics. That's, that's a legitimate possibility. Uh, once again, I don't think it really would account for a large number of alligator sightings. Uh, they were escaped sewer cleaners. Um, I'll have more about that in a minute, just let it go. Uh, and theory D, they were discarded pets and souvenirs. And that's the one I think that really has the most credence. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll show you my evidence uh, as we proceed. Let's go back to this escaped sewer cleaners business. I threw this in because I think it was fun. In my research, I turned up an account of uh, folks in Florida, right? Uh, who would use alligators to clean sewer pipes. Uh, this is an illustration from Popular Mechanics. They tie a rope to the tail of an alligator, send him through a clogged pipe. He would manage to squeeze his way through and then they would pull the, whatever the brush or whatever it took to scrape the pipe clean through the other end. So this was an, an example of a alligator purposefully introduced into the sewer system, right? Now, I only turned up accounts of this happening in Florida, so I don't believe that the New York City alligator sightings uh, come from attempts to clean the sewer system. So I'm just gonna dismiss that one hardly. Let's go back to the discarded pets and souvenirs theory. Um, I really believe in this theory. Uh, given my research about the creation of Central Park, the Central Park Zoo, originally called the Central Park Menagerie. Uh, and by the way, Central Park was created from the 1850s to the 1870s. The Central Park Menagerie was not an original feature of the park design. Once the park was being built, people randomly, without any sort of solicitation, presented to the park commissioners donations of live and dead animals, right? Now, this is an illustration that ran in the Harper's Weekly, this is 1866, and it shows this assortment of crazy wild animals. These were all donations. These were donations from rich people who went overseas, collected animals that they thought would be pets for their children back home or would be easy to tend for in a city like New York. And they got here and they realized this was a mistake. And they basically hauled it off to Central Park and donated to what would become the menagerie slash the zoo. Now, if you think I might be, oops, might be fanciful here, the, the creators of Central Park were meticulous recorders of uh, the events that were required, the, the, the actions that were required to build the park. And they kept minute details of these donations. So here's a page from a Central Park Commission report. And this is typical, this is typical. We've got the spring to the summer of 1865. Look at the red arrows. Three of uh, four alligators were donated to the park, one of them dead, but four alligators. This was typical. So you have this phenomenon of people collecting pets, souvenirs, and then not wanting them and basically trying to unload them. Okay. Now, I also believe so, this was one phase of how this worked. In the 20th century, I think you have a new element being introduced, and that is mail order alligators. People who would acquire alligators through the mail as pets, right? Now, here are two advertisements. One ran in Johnson Smith and Company catalog, 1938, another in Popular Mechanics Magazine, 1934. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s, you'd have comic books in the back, you'd have all these sorts of advertisements that would appeal to teenage boys, right? And I would see these ads, right? So they were, they were pervasive in popular culture, especially adolescent popular culture for decades. And this ad on the right here is my favorite. I love the last line. It says, do you want a baby alligator? You bet you do. What boy wouldn't, right? Now, to show you what's going, and this wasn't a hoax. This wasn't like x-ray glasses, right? Which was basically just bamboozling youngsters. No, this was real. Here's a, here's a scene from a mail order, uh, the mail order department of the Los Angeles alligator farm in the 1920s. Here are these women packing up alligators in these cardboard boxes. Now, 
this was a little dangerous uh, because sometimes the alligators would escape. I read tons of stories of escaped alligators uh, in post offices across the country, uh, like this one here, Rome, New York. Uh, the mystery of Rome's post office alligator has been solved, right? Basically somebody was shipping a mail order alligator to somebody and the thing got out, right? Here's a more local story. Pet alligator outgrows tub. What then? Woman goes to court. This ran in the Daily Eagle in 1937. Last March, little Oscar, now big Oscar, an alligator, was sent to Mrs. Catherine Fitzgerald of 7409 62nd Street, Ridgewood, by friends in Florida. Oscar got too big for the bathtub. So today, Mrs. Fitzgerald went to Lewis J. Owens, Queen's Felony Court Complaint Clerk, for advice explaining she couldn't turn Oscar loose because he might bite someone. Owens called the ASPCA, right? Now, you might think, okay, well, that's crazy, but you know what? That era has passed. We've come to our senses, right? Here are the current day mailing regulations. Notice the red arrow. You can mail baby alligators as well as all these other wonderful creatures, right? And you might think that's crazy, right? Well, it's actually not so crazy when you think about it. There are industries that rely on, you know, small, safe uh, creatures that can be cost-effectively delivered through the mails. I'm thinking about pet shops, I'm thinking about zoos, I'm thinking about scientific institutions. So there is, uh, a decent reason for this sort of thing, okay? Anyway, so this legend has spread around the world. Here are some illustrations uh, about alligators in our sewers and other places like the subway, things like that. I, I learned of this legend when I was a youngster. I fell in love with it, and I'm glad I eventually, as an adult, decided to dig deep into its origins. And when the 75th anniversary of the original East Harlem alligator sighting rolled around, I said to myself, this anniversary cannot go uncelebrated. And so got myself a proclamation from the borough president, borough president, right? Uh, to declare February 9th alligator in the sewer day. And we had a little ceremony on the steps of city hall. That's me with the orange hat in the middle. Uh, I was joined by the commissioner of the Department of Records on the left, Brian Anderson, and uh, Vincent Sapienza, who was at the time an assistant commissioner for the Department of Environmental Protection, who eventually became the commissioner. So I know people in high places, although he's not the commissioner anymore. And uh, we had this little ceremony, and I've been celebrating Alligator in the Sewer Day uh, annually ever since. Before I let this topic go, I do wanna mention that I do have in my heart of hearts a, a dream, right? Uh, to actually acquire what may be an existing scrap of this original East Harlem alligator. And what makes me persist in this dream? Well, a few weeks after the alligator sighting, a little article ran in the Brooklyn Eagle. Now, when the alligator was eventually discarded up in East Harlem, he was put on the back of a sanitation truck brought to Barron Island. That's where New York City has its, had its incinerator at the time. And this article tells how the workers at Barron Island placed the alligator in the incinerator and bits of it would not burn. And so what they did is they actually cut off those bits and save them. It says, point of our story is that part of the hide just wouldn't burn. The fact determined by several of the men who worked in the incinerator, that uh, this fact determined by several of the men who worked in the incinerator had a bright idea. From the ashes, they picked out the bits of skin, took them home, planning to have swell Christmas presents for their wives next Christmas. So I hope that somewhere in a dusty attic or basement in a box in Brooklyn, there is a remnant of that original alligator number one, 
that started this legend, right? So that's my hope and my dream. That concludes this portion of the double header. Uh, coming up, we will have an interview with Thomas Hines. So Tom, I'm gonna add, invite you to come up here so we can talk about your wonderful book. That was awesome. Thank you. All right. I would look here for those alligator bits, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have a look around here. I've never been here before. This place is incredible. Okay. <laughs> so let me, let me, I don't think we need our, my slides anymore. Okay. So it's just me and you now. Great. Okay, great. Good to see you again. Yeah. Likewise. <laughs> uh, I was, I was hoping to do this interview at the Morning Star Diner. Right. We originally met, but then I found <laughs> this a little bit nicer. quieter, nicer uh, places. Tom interviewed me for the book and, uh, and we met at this, my nearby diner. Hold on, I'm gonna just make this a little bit more. Everything bagels with uh, bacon, egg and cheese, if I remember correctly. Oh, Same yeah. order, it was, uh, and it was great. You know, you have this guy here speaking to you when you're writing this book. Uh, you don't just do sewer alligator questions. I ran through other things with you as well and got your, your point of view on a lot of stuff. So you were really helpful yeah. for a couple chapters in this book. I think I, I think I steered you to Carl Melling, didn't I? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, right. yeah. that's right, that's well, right. We might yeah. be talking about that okay, in a minute. Great. Anyway, so let me tell you about this guy. So whenever I do something like this, I always ask my interview subject to send me a biography and I say, send me three sentences because I know I'll get five sentences and that, that'll be fine, right? So I asked him, Tom, send me three sentences. He sends me two sentences, right? <laughs> so right off the bat, I fell in love with you right there, okay? But two sentences, that's it. and one of the sentences is I wrote this book, right? All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do you justice, my friend. So this is from the book. Thomas Hines is a writer who lives in Brooklyn Heights with his wife, Veronica, their dog, Ladybug, and now son? Son, Arthur. Yeah, son he was pre-production for the book. Yeah, okay. He's, he's, he's got for, this, for the paperback, he'll be around. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, his work has been featured in Sierra Club, and uh, the in Sierra Club, The All, The Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum, Gothamist, Business Insider, McSweeney's Internet Tendency. I have no idea what that is. PR Week and Untapped New York. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. that's an impressive list of things. Uh, so before we leave your bio and your authorship of this book, I think it's only fair to mention that this is not entirely your work. No. It is, yeah. So Yeah, so as the cover attests, the, uh, the book is illustrated by Kath Nash, who... Uh, was an illustrator of Brooklyn. She's now an illustrator of Los Angeles. And the book is basically, as it says, 40 animals, but there are 44 chapters uh, in all told. And each chapter has a full page illustration, not just of the animal, but usually as the animal exists in New York City. So there's a red tail hawk on the, um, the statue at Bethesda uh, Fountain in Central Park. I can't think of the name of it there. There's a peregrine falcon flying in front of the Chrysler building and so on and so forth. These so. illustrations are wonderful. They, Everything is wonderful. Now, when he says chapter, we're talking about a very, pardon the pun, yeah, yeah. bite-sized chapters, bite -sized, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, this is a great book for kids. It does have a couple of dirty words in there. One or so two. you might want yeah, to, one yeah, two, okay. Yeah. Not a, yeah, one's, a, <laughs> one's a direct quote from, yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, that's your excuse, <laughs> right? It's a direct quote. All right. Uh, <laughs> All right, so I tell you what, the, uh, the first thing we should actually do is if you would read an excerpt. Oh, sure, book. sure, sure, sure. So uh, this is from uh, a chapter about the East River monster, uh, which was a carcass of not really known origin that washed right underneath the Brooklyn Bridge uh, Tower on the Manhattan side. There's a little patch uh, of sand there, uh, mm -hmm. uh, incredibly. And this was a few years after the Montauk monster and, and Long Island had washed ashore. And it really kind of became this internet, you know, frenzy, but people really uh, identified with it. And I really, when I had this idea for the book, I, I wanted to include the natural animals and we'll get a full list of what I included later, but I also wanted to do more of these whimsical things. So uh, without further ado, um, Richard Lawson, writing one of the many Gawker articles on the Montauk monster, captured the appeal perfectly when he wrote that monsters are the world's troubles made manifest, and that these stories resonate with people because we all knew deep inside all along that monsters were real. It's fair to say that the Montauk monster was still fresh in people's minds when the East River monster appeared in Manhattan. What's more, New York City is an ideal setting for a monster. It's even a bit poetic. Here's this great metropolis that tamed nature 
yet could not explain this new wild arrival at its shore. Perhaps the years of environmental pollution had come back to haunt New Yorkers, and the East River Monster was a toxic byproduct from one of the city's EPA Superfund sites, such as Newtown Creek in Queens or the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn. Or maybe, or maybe some local maniac scientist, spurned by years of living alone in the big city, made the East River Monster in his apartment. Or maybe it was all part of some elaborate marketing scheme hatched nearby on, Men on Madison Avenue. Eventually, the official word came down from the New York City Parks Department. It was actually a pig that someone had cooked and it discarded in the river, <laughs> if you want to believe that. A New York Magazine <laughs> summed up the collective incredulity with a July headline that read, we are supposed to believe this is just a pig. Gothamist reached out to a Cornell professor who said it was a dog. Gawker never seemed to decide on any definition that didn't include the word monster. And as the debate continued to rage online, the Parks Department had the carcass incinerated, leaving only more questions and mystery. <laughs> So you can see from that excerpt that this is not just a naturalist guide. It's not a field, no, it's not a field guide. Yeah. York, right. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, yeah. I, 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 want, I want to stress that this is, if you're looking for like, you know, migration range chart, you're Some not going to yeah, find yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 this yeah. is about, and, and then the, the subtitles, a brief history of New York City and 40 animals. And that is very much true. There's a lot of history here. You take these animals and you don't just, give us facts yeah. and statistics, you tell us great stories, historical stories. Well, I, I'll say that, you know, I, I grew up around here. My parents and grandparents are from Park Slope and just New York City has just always been my favorite thing. And I, animals are great, but this was an opportunity really to write about New York City. And there are a few animals where I really wanted to talk about certain places. I wanted to talk about the Gowanus Canal, the Collect Pond, mm -hmm. the Fresh Kills Landfill, now Fresh Kills Park in Staten Island and was able to anchor an animal that I sometimes wasn't really that interested in, but right. allowed me to tell the story of Fresh Gills right. or the story of Gowanus. So. so without further ado, I think it's, it would be a, a, a service to sure. everyone listening if we got this list of 40 Absolutely. animals. So if you could read Absolutely. them to us. Absolutely. Um, so there's an introduction. Uh, there is a, a brief, they're all brief, but there's a chapter, a uh, second introduction about how New York City looked naturally before the Europeans arrived. So that's called Where the Wild Things Were. Then there's a section on native uh, animals and there's the mastodon, uh, the black crowned night heron, geese, deer, sharks, groundhogs, uh, specifically the one that Bill de Blasio dropped. Uh, <laughs> I don't wanna give anything away. You're, you're, give, you're getting ahead of my question, sir. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, I'm getting... Red tail hawks, striped bass, turtles, raccoons. There's a legend or celebrity section. That's alligators in the sewer, the collect pond monster, the East River monster, uh, dolphins, an elephant, the mandarin duck, a tiger, penguins, pandas, and then we have worker animals, including dogs, honeybees, horses, sheep, pigs, and oysters. Uh, returned animals, animals that have come back since the Clean Water Act and the EPA of the 1970s, and this really is sort of the, um, the vindication of all that work. We have beavers, grasshopper sparrows, shipworms, humpback whales, peregrine falcons, and seals, and then because this is a book about New York City, we have immigrants or newcomers, and that includes roaches, cats, rats, starlings, bed bugs, coyotes, mosquitoes, parrots, and of course, pigeons. Uh, and then the last chapter is uh, looking forward as uh, how New York City can continue to make this a more wild place, and that's called Where the Wild Things Will Be. So, is that isn't that a delicious <laughs> list? Don't you want to? <laughs> I just want to run out and get the book just, just <laughs> from hearing that list. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a menu at a great restaurant. All right, so let's, let, 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 let's dive in. Let's dive in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a, a fact that surprised and stunned and pleased me. So I'll quote from the Falcons mm. chapter. And you start off right here at the first sentence. There are more peregrine falcons per square mile in New York City than in any other place in the world. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Tell right? us. Right. So yeah. peregrine falcon, fastest animal on earth, uh, like a lot of uh, animals in, in North America, and just I guess the world, you know, we're really affected by hundreds of years of industrialization that really came to a head in the late 50s and late 60s. Uh, the peregrine falcon um, were, were sort of really harmed by DDT, which is the main culprit in Silent Spring. And there were many manifestations of that. Uh, a group of scientists at Cornell, I believe, it was an upstate New York school, uh, started the Peregrine Fund. There's one guy named Tom Cade uh, who identified that this was happening and set on a very, uh, and this is a place where I did clean it up for the book, a very elaborate and crazy captive breeding program that included these hats that the falconers would wear. And it's, I wrote a separate article about that. 
it's 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 insane. It's, 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 it's insane. They have. They, but basically, it's an artificial insemination hat. Yeah, yeah. And the falconer would wear the hat every day until the falcon identified him and the hat as his mate. And then the falcon would eventually, after months of daily work, would would mount the hat. And it's like, why the hat? Like what? Like, but yeah. it was just it's it. But it Puppets worked. Were, yeah. But now worked. this animal's not even in danger. Yeah. So it not only did it work. And the reason why they do so well in New York, I would say, is that. You know, they don't live in nests, they live in scrapes on ledges. And what do we have a lot of here are, are ledges. And what do we also have a lot of here are pigeons. And so this is not a natural real relationship. Pigeons are from like the Mediterranean, I think. Like they're not, they're not, I don't even, it's hard to really know where pigeons are meant to be yeah. from because they're everywhere, uh, but they're not from New York City. Uh, but the peregrine falcons have done very well here where in the wild, they might need a larger, hunting range gotcha. here it can be ah, a few blocks because there's feast. enough there's enough pigeons it's a feast yeah or okay. rats too all right now let's talk about tigers sure. right this those of you who are new yorkers from way back <laughs> will recognize this story tigers right we're not talking about a zoo tiger no, here either no, no. right so uh this is back 2003 uh a story about a gentleman uh by the name of where is he mr antoine, uh, antoine yes. yates right who was keeping an alligator in his public housing apartment? Well, 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 you're right, yeah. but I, but it was a tiger. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, but what, to yeah. give it away, he actually also had a tiger in that apartment. So, so what did I say? You did said I, you I, said he was keeping an alligator. But he, oh, an alligator. But, of course, he was oh, not right. right. But he actually was. He had an alligator. But he was. So he was actually was. Yeah. Obviously, have alligators on the yeah. brain. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote from this chapter. Yates had. Yates per first purchased Ming, that's the name of the tiger, from an animal dealer in Minnesota when the tiger was about eight weeks old. For the next three years, Ming lived, Ming lived alongside Yates in his relatively spacious five bedroom apartment. Ming would follow Yates around like a shadow, even resting his giant tiger head in Yates's lap while the man meditated. So naturally my question is, how on earth is it possible for somebody in New York City to have a five bedroom apartment? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> in a public housing right, project. Right, 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 right. That's right? the biggest scandal. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no <laughs> chapter on that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So it was the, uh, it was the Drew Hamilton houses, oh. like 110 blocks north of here, like 153rd Street or something like that. Uh -huh. And he, uh, he, it was through his mother. His mother had, had was involved in the, um, she would take in like for other kids. So she needed a bigger apartment. She was out of state and apparently none of the neighbors knew, but then after they found the tiger, they said, oh, we always knew, you know. We always kind of, knew. Yeah, kind of <laughs> and I had no problem with <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, right. But I got him on the phone. I reached out to him on Facebook and he, and he got in touch with me. And just in the conversation, he's telling me this whole thing about the conflict and how, and I won't give it away, but how it was uncovered was this pretty explosive situation. And as an aside, he goes, I also had a caiman in the bathtub. That's kind of an alligator. I'm like, wait a minute, stop. Wait, you also had an alligator in the apartment? So it was a, uh, a lot of good decisions. So I think, I think, I mean, you should, you should give us a little resolution on this uh, because I sure. think this is a, this is a legend. A lot of us know. So, and I, and so, I, yeah, and I was just actually talking to Karen about this illustration because, yeah. uh, Kath, the illustrator was great. And I said, you know, some of these you can write, you can draw whatever you want. But this illustration, as you can see, is a cop who is repelling down the side, uh, looking into the window of a tiger standing on its back legs. Roaring. This is from a picture in the New York Post. This yeah. is almost paint by numbers. And so for this one, I was like, it has to be this image because it's right. the best image. Uh, so they have been living peacefully for three years. Antoine is a nice guy, if not uh, has questionable decision making, but he <laughs> found a cat three years into this uh and he also said he had lions previously so he he found a cat he brought it into the apartment because instead of bringing it to a vet it was injured he said i i alone can fix this cat Ooh, sure uh and the tiger who's his best friend in the morning sees the cat and is like oh yeah i'm a tiger i'm gonna kill that cat mm -hmm. antoine stands in the middle the cat uh, the tiger knocks him down he uh, like really does avoid the tiger being confrontational a couple of times. But then the tiger's like, look, I'm a tiger, <laughs> bites into his leg. And Antoine was able to get him to relent and took himself to the hospital uh, where he said a pit bull had bit him. The cop said, you know, uh, and that's when the cop repelled. They actually looked through the keyhole. They saw the tiger and then he repelled down the side and shot him with a tranquilizer. Uh, this same day, this same day this happened was the day that Siegfried and Roy's 
tigers wow. attacked them on stage and did not relent. So wow. he kind of maybe had a bet. I mean, it's not, I don't know, but he, he got his tiger to relent, I will just say. That's like defense. the night of the grizzly. Are you familiar with that story? No, no. No grizzly bear attacks in the, in the West for 20 years yeah. or 20 plus years. One night, two separate attacks wow. happen. Two, two, two yeah. uh, uh, deaths, wow. two grizzly yeah. deaths. One, one night in this 20 year span, the same night. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then the tiger, he, he got arrested. Uh, the tiger uh, was sent to Berlin, Ohio, where it lived until about a year ago. And at a, like a, you know, uh, an animal rescue situation. This is all before Tiger King. But when that came out, I was like, I got a book for you. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, and by the way, a, a postscript to the story, I remember reading what maybe a year ago, Ming had actually yeah, passed away. after a good long so, life. So about yeah. 15 years later after, after the fact, so. Okay, so this is New York City. So uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a multiple choice here, sure. but we have to talk about this. Um, pigeons, roaches, rats, yeah. pick one pigeons. and let's talk pigeons. about it. Pigeons, pigeons, like uh, in a heartbeat. For one, uh, that's okay, Victoria. Pigeons are very smart. Pigeons are can be very friendly. I, I I've come into this book not knowing much about a lot of animals. I've come out knowing a little bit. Uh, my attitude has changed on some animals. Has not changed. Like for instance, I went into writing this book not liking geese. I still don't like geese. Uh, I went into this book writing this book not liking roaches. I hate roaches now. Uh, I have a kind of a quiet, distant respect for rats, but I don't want anything to do with them. I think pigeons are fantastic. Uh, for no other reason than they feed this healthy population of raptors that we have. But they're great for other reasons, you know, but there's a, uh, if anyone's interested, there's a, a wildlife rehabilitator uh, organization on the Upper West Side called the Wild Bird Fund. They take in thousands of animals a year and half of them are pigeons. So wow. the pigeon hospital, they're great people. There you go. Yeah. By the way, for those folks looking at home, our, our camera has a mind of its own. Okay. So we thought we had locked it into place so that both of us would appear, but it has decided it wants to look at you. <laughs> I have no problem with that. So I will just be a disembodied voice speaking <laughs> off screen. That and that's fine. Don't, <laughs> we won't try to fix it anymore. Okay, so uh, another multiple choice. Sure. Uh, the historian and me chose these not the New Yorker in me, horses, pigs, beavers. Pick one, uh, let's talk about beavers it. Beavers are, I think, one of the most important animals in all of all the animals in the book. I think it's beavers and oysters are, are the top, most uh, important necessary. Can, can I give you a little pushback on that? Sure, sure. First of all, I think that oysters are, are the, have become the darling. Yeah. Uh, and I do not, I do not think they deserve that <laughs> that darling place in, in people's minds. Sure, sure. But I, but I get it. Yeah. I get it. You know, and I like oysters. Sure. And there, it's a great story. But it does. In, in my little, my little trio of options here, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even think of including them. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Now you chose beavers, and of course, beavers, fundamental to the creation and the. Uh, proliferation of early New York City. Of the, co of the colony, right? right? Of the whole, yeah. And, and, and you can go there. You yeah. made your choice and this is your book, right? <laughs> but if I were choosing, and maybe you'll indulge me a little of bit, I would have chose horses. Yeah, I can see that. Horses, yeah. come on, yeah. horses. And people don't realize that. No, no, right? no. Okay, that's, so, yeah. so there you go. Talk about beavers well, and then maybe talk about horses. Let's move into horses, yeah. Okay. So, and pigs too. I, I think they're all actually really important animals yeah. in the history of New York. But for the beaver, it's just that it's a, almost an existential thing. Like this exists in this way, or, you know, beavers yeah. really got the whole thing going. Got, they got it started. There's two beavers on the New York City flag, not one, but two. There's right. two beavers on the New York City flag. The City College mascot is a beaver. Uh, beaver Street downtown, Astor Place has all the beavers and the, and the subway tiles. And what I liked about the beaver story was, you know, and, and writ large, the book is about three dates. It's about 1609 when the Europeans arrived and for lack, for, you know, short story, they kind of ruined everything, ecologically speaking. Uh, it's about 1972, which is the low water mark, the, the environmental reckoning, and it's about now. And the beavers obviously were a victim of that first environmental degradation. This was, there were beavers everywhere and there were no beavers for 200 years. And that one returned in 2008 was so narratively yes. nice right. to me. Right. But the horses, I had no idea about. It's just as far as transport and the, the idea that stoops are, exist because there was horse manure on the street level. So you had like, even, 
you know, all of these things are like baked yeah. into our, our yeah. And, our and the statistics the you have there about yeah. how many horses there were, yeah. how much horse manure they ate, how much food they consumed, yeah. right? And dead horses, uh, just the weight of dead horses, right? Like the amount of horses um, that would just die every year and be left to die in the street or taken to Barren Island, right? At Dead Horse Bay, right? Yeah. Dead Horse Bay, which is not a family name. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, and see, I'll, say about, so I'll say about pigs too. Sure, sure, is sure. Is sure. that they were like oysters, a very important source of protein for lower income people. But they also were, they'll say that they were the, the original sanitation department. Like they cleaned Absolutely, up the trash right, and turned right. the trash into protein, right. which was not a bad deal, right? right for, for, for a struggling Absolutely. family. Yeah. And there's the Piggery War. The Great Piggery War of 1859. Give us, give us a couple of sentences <laughs> yeah. on the Great Piggery War. So you were talking earlier about Central Park and the creation of it. So the 1850s to the 1870s, and you know, you I'm telling you this story. This is I'm telling the part of but the story. Know you're the history of New York City. But okay, so so New York City's posts. history sort of went south to north, right? The European, the post-European history of New York City went from you know financial district up uptown, uptown, ever going uptown. And Central Park and the grid was in place sort of before the development was there, mm -hmm. and so there were pig farms not far from here, actually just sort of more towards Times Square and towards Central Park South. And where are we for the folks at home who are here? We are at 44th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. So Midtown, New York. Uh, and as Central Park opened, the, the streetcars, which were horse powered, uh, would shuttle people up to this new park, but they would have to take them past these like wretched, stinking piggeries uh, that smelled for a variety of reasons from the awful to the pigs themselves. And uh, you know, they had to, the, the, the carriages would go double speed through pig town, hog town is what it's called, okay. hog town. And um, finally, as like a, you know, an, a, a sign of things to come in New York City real estate, there's like, you got to go, there are nicer people coming, you know, uh -huh. which is sort of like a theme in New York City. <laughs> and uh, the gentrification, gentrification of town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, town. and it's also a, a thing that I think New York City uh, doesn't realize, uh, or one of the things that I come to realize is that we are disconnected from where our waste goes, where our water comes from, and where our food comes from. And that we were not disconnected from that in New York City. The, the pigs were right here, in right. fact. And this was one of the first moments where that was shoved out for sort of quote unquote nicer living, you know? Right. And uh, the cops put out an order saying, we're gonna clear all of these pigsties uh, in 1859. I forget the months, but I'm sure it's in the book. And um, the, they're mostly Irish, uh, uh, and I, my, my family is Irish as well, so I can, I can talk down <laughs> on them. Disclaimer. Yeah, uh, before I say anything offensive. Um, so the, uh, but actually, but even the newspaper accounts of the day were, were pretty anti-Irish, you know, they, these Hibernian, Absolutely, yes. you know, squealing from these crazy Hibernian ladies. And meanwhile, their houses are getting torn down by the police. Uh, and there was a moment where it looked like the, the pig farmers, I believe aided by the fire department, were gonna take on the cops. And uh, cooler yeah, heads sort let of. Let me just say, yeah. there was a lot of crazy right. stuff yeah. going on in in the service, the, the uniformed uh, industries <laughs> sure, uh, sure. in the 1850s for reasons I will not go into <laughs> sure, here. But sure. okay, that yeah, and so it, it was it was sort of this hyped up thing, like there's going to be this conflict, uh, and then I think there were really no casualties in the end, except for some some styes that had not been packed up, and then <laughs> they got destroyed, and it was cleared, and. Now the Russians on the neighborhood. So it's great. It's all go. the oligarchs on the neighborhood, okay. which is great. See, so we managed to cover all three bases, right? Which is kind of what I was hoping for yeah. anyway, when I yeah. put those three together. Okay. So how did you come to write this book? I mean, you mentioned a little bit of it earlier. Is there more? We yeah, sure. Know? Yeah. So I, I have been uh, working in like a public relations as like a, a copywriter uh, kind of job and, and didn't love it and uh, wanted just to do more freelance writing. And my mom and dad are from Brooklyn. Uh, I had been living in New York for years. I grew up in the suburbs in Connecticut, uh, but New York City was always like where I wanted to be, where I wanted to live and what I wanted to read and know about. And just decided to, you know, I knew that my parents actually, the first thing I wrote was about alligators in the sewer. Before I had but the idea for the book, friend. before anything, I just wanted to write an article. <laughs> hmm. And I, you know, I was like, where did this legend come from? Because it's not just my dad telling me uh. that this existed. Uh, but even the story that you told, that's exactly how I was told. And then you talk to other people and it's the same story they heard. Uh, and so I did that and uh, was with some friends a couple of weeks later. And one of them said, you know what you got to do? You got to go out to um, uh, Greenwood Cemetery and learn about those monk parrots. Right. And uh, I, I actually had a light bulb moment 
uh, where I was like, this could be a book. I thought I could get to maybe eight animals. Uh, I, when I brought it to the publisher, I had 24. They challenged me to get to 40. And I could probably be 50 if I wrote the book today. I mean, there's just one story kind of led to yeah. another. Yeah, yeah, I bet you people have approached yeah. you and said, yeah. how you forgot about yeah, this. Yeah, you forgot about this. Forgot. And stuff about I wanted that, that I've right. since discovered. I'm like, that's a big story. Right, I would have gone right, wrong. right. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go to some more fun facts that I discovered reading your book. Uh, New York City has about 20 coyotes. Yeah, probably more by now. Probably yeah, that, more that, by that's now. a 2019 statistic, 2020 wow. statistic. Yeah. They're in, uh, well, behind so, you. Yeah, they're right there. <laughs> be very still, be very still. Um, so, the, this is another one of those uh, New York City specific things. You know, in Chicago, Los Angeles, where there are coyotes, you just walk right in. We're a bunch of islands, right? right? So, it makes sense that a coyote could get to the Bronx now, makes sense. The reason it's their larger writ is because we got rid of the other apex predators that are, are, keen, are, are, are native to this area, bears and wolves and things like that. We've also flattened the landscape with right. development to the Southwest. So they basically have walked in. How do they get to Queens? How do they get to Manhattan where they are? Uh, and Staten Island is they swim, they take train track bridges. Um, and the last update I made to the book when I got the last edit was that there had been a spotting in Central Park which was a huge deal. There had been some spottings in Manhattan, uh, but then since the book has come out, I was actually just walking through the park with a friend of mine, saw a park ranger and I asked her, and she said that they have resident coyotes in Central Park, not just sightings, but there are dens wow. there. I don't know where they are, probably in the North Woods, um, but everyone I've spoken to, uh, I spoke to a few people for that chapter, that it's a good thing. And that it's actually not a, you know, a top-down predator is good ecologically and they're, they're a good, fit for New York City because they're, they're, they're people averse uh, mm -hmm. and they can make a go of it in like an empty lot. They don't always need your Central Parks or your Van Cortlands, though they will take advantage of those places for sure. Cool. Yeah. So what was your, in, in your research, right? You obviously had to meet people, go places, discover yeah, things. Yeah. What was, yeah, well, I don't think the Morningstar Diner exactly rates up there as, the, as the best adventure in your research. What was the best adventure in your research, the most fun? Tell us uh, what, what you love the most in, I, I, in one of these I did walk through Van Cortlandt Park looking for a coyote and then realized, oh God, what if I find this coyote? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, like, they're not I was like, like people. I was like, I took the one train here. Like, what am I like? This is not, I'm not prepared for this. Uh, but I would say that uh, going on a uh, whale watching tour off of Jacob Reese Landing uh, on the Rockaways and reliably seeing humpback whales in New York Harbor is the coolest thing. And it's like, not even in this cool. book, like one of the coolest things I've ever had. I couldn't believe that. I okay. could not believe that. Got, I was going to say, we got one more thing before we wrap it up, but I, you said something that sort of inspired me to add another thing. Sure. So one of my favorite stories, uh, it's kind of one of these success stories with a, with a twist, is the shipworms. Yeah, yeah. So could you... So, so, so yeah, so very briefly, um, shipworms are a small mollusk that eat wood, uh, driftwood, but also ship bottoms or piers that support the FDR, Brooklyn Bridge Park, or all these others ways that we have moved out into the harbor. For a hundred years in that great century plus of environmental degradation, shipworms were not a problem because we polluted the water so much, but neither were oysters, neither were whales or dolphins or sharks, like right. we kept everything at bay. <laughs> so after the Clean Water Act and things have, you know, 50 years ago and things have slowly returned, but we have these whales and we have these dolphins and these seals and that's great, but the shipworms have come back too. And I live in Dumbo. That's the other update. I, I, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, you know, Brooklyn Heights to Dumbo is the other update. <laughs> uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park is right there. And the folks that I spoke to at Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is all rehabilitated piers mostly um, with soccer fields on them and things like that, that the $400 million price tag, that 300 million of it was in shipworm uh, prevention, maintenance, wow. control, whatever. Yeah. And they have wow. like three different things they were trying. And it's a constant job. It's a constant wow. job. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I want to wrap things up with, uh, with, something, with something I learned from your book. Now, I knew half this story, but I didn't know the other half. Now, there is a saying, of course, in politics that it's not the crime, it's the cover-up, right? <laughs> Tell us the story of Bill de Blasio <laughs> and the groundhog. Our poor, our poor departed tall mayor. He, uh, he uh, was three months into office, or no, maybe three weeks, and... Uh, was invited to the Staten Island Zoo to do their Groundhog Day, uh, you know, because Groundhog Day is February 2nd, Inauguration Day is January 1st, so it was really maybe Close, a month, yeah, yeah. and um, 
you know, I think everybody knows that uh, Bill de Blasio is not liked by most people, but was not really unliked in Staten Island relative to his right, turnout. Right, so right, this right. is already like a hostile room. Right. And uh, he is handed a, a, a groundhog that he is told is Chuck the groundhog, uh, who is our punk Satani Phil. He, the, something happens in the handoff. The thing squirms out of his hands. And five days later, they say that the, that the groundhog has died. From his injuries. From his injuries. Right. But it was her injuries. A month later, it was revealed that it wasn't Chuck. It was his granddaughter, Charlotte. Why? <laughs> Why? <Wait. laughs> because Chuck had bit Bloomberg in 2009. <laughs> so, they did, so they have this brand new mayor. And they're like, we don't, you know, they don't want a toothy situation. So they, they, they sub in Charlotte without telling him. And then just all of these things sort of trickled out. They're like, the groundhog is dead. It wasn't Chuck. You're like, what? like, it just, <laughs> like the most needless scandal and fun, I think. And then of course, uh, like two years after that, a groundhog was spotted at City Hall Park. Looking right. For, looking for revenge. Looking yeah. for revenge, looking for right. Revenge. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that certainly goes up there with, Bill de Blasio's uh, greatest gaffe, <laughs> oh. except for eating pizza with a fork right. and knife. And I will say, I point out in the book that Bill de Blasio is an, is an above averagely tall person. Right, right. Fiorello LaGuardia could have dropped the groundhog and might have survived. Five right. foot three. <laughs> right. You got to take in all the, all the, right. all the right. facts right. into account. All right. I think that's a great way to wrap up this portion. Uh, I have had my say. It's time for the people to speak. Great. Uh, so we're going to entertain some questions. Yes? From about alligators or about the other 39 <laughs> creatures? First of all, thank you both so much. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, coming in online, and I'm sure the audience here are going to have some. Um, and to ask our first question uh, is Victoria. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm going to be a little greedy here with three fast ones. In terms of Kath Nash, how did you connect with her? And if you could just hold up, especially for our at-home audience, sure. maybe some of these beautiful illustrations. Yeah, and the second one is I grew up in Inwood, right? And the park was in a stone's throw. So uh, just if you found anything in, in Inwood and just one more, and Michael, this will be yours. So with respect to pursuing, because we really want to help you, anyone in this audience, this has been so wonderful. The pieces of the alligator, <laughs> What's your process and how can we keep our eyes out for you? <laughs> I'll just answer this one quick. I don't know. Let's talk later. Okay. <laughs> That's a curveball. Okay. And by the way, if you if you don't have an inward answer, I can help. I, you. I've got well, so the mastodon was 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 sure. found when uh, you sort of not in the park, but just near it. Um, and then uh, there was a, a young seal, harbor seal, in that little cove, which I can't remember the name of, but that's it. Was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, so it's, so that that is that was I believe mentioned in the book that that seal had made its that normally they're on an island off of Staten Island called Swinburne Island. That's a very a guaranteed place to see a harbor seal. There are many other places to see one, including that that small cove uh, in Inwood, in Inwood Park specifically. So can I'm gonna I'm gonna tag team you sure. with here with the with the mastodon. Sure, sure. Because uh, we talked about the mastodon. Yes, we, we met. Did, yeah, and that's how I set you up with. Carl Melling. So in research for a project I did earlier, I came across this reference references to mastodon discoveries in the New York City area. There have been three mastodon least, discoveries, yeah, yeah. right? And in my, in my, for my project, I read an account, uh, a contemporaneous account that a piece of mastodon tusk had been discovered and it was donated to the American Museum of Natural History. And this is in 1888 or yeah, something like yeah. that. Now I knew the guy who was in charge of the fossil collection at the American Carl. Museum of Natural History, Carl Mellon, because we book. went to the same high school. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, not at the same time, okay. but at the same high school, yeah. right? And and we Stuyvesant alums stick together. <laughs> and so I like emailed him or I, I spoke to him on the phone. I said, Carl, you know, I got this reference to this mastodon tusk that was donated to the American Museum of Natural History in 1888. Yeah. You guys still have this? And he goes, we're the American Museum of Natural History. We never throw anything out. Fossils, of course fossils are our thing, and so, yeah. And yeah. so he gave me a picture of it. So That's I got great. a picture of it. The other, the quick story about the Mastodon too mm -hmm. is that you, you mentioned something about people making gifts with it. 
they found this, these T teeth yeah. when they're digging the subway, they call then the Carl Melling of its day, Dr. Mook. He goes uptown, he puts three of these things in his pocket. He gets two of them pickpocketed out of his pocket <laughs> in the walk back to the car. And then they, and one of the papers got a quote with the pickpocket and he's like, I'm getting it for my wife. I bet she loves it. Like, <laughs> it's like, and then they got a return, but it was like the most New York. And that's why this is not a field guide. Like, how could you not? That's like, this is a New York book. Too. Those like, stories yeah, are in here yeah, plenty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Wait, are they oh, we have a question right here. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm, I, if you don't mind, sir, I'm just going to take uh, one of our uh, online uh, questions, first of all, and then I'll come over and uh, you can be you can be next. We've got some really great online questions, as I'm sure we have for our own person audience. First of all, have you thought about making a documentary based on your book? Um, my, my sister-in-law is here and has told me to. So yes, she has thought of it and uh, <laughs> it's going to give me a hard time that you asked that question. So, right, so okay. That, maybe well, she there wrote you go. the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, I, I will take an in-person question. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Uh, do you have, I think you have eagles in there, so I'm not, fam I'm not sure if you're familiar with Pale male, the red-tailed hawk at the 72nd Street sailboat basin, and the story behind that. That's in that's in the yes, the, the okay, red, with the, his nest and, yeah, and that whole controversy. Yeah, yeah. by Mary Tyler that's Moore. Right. And yeah. Then they took the nest down. Okay, and, that's in there. And it's yes, it's it because that was the sort of this first celebrity bird. Yeah, right. Really identified <laughs> right. With. And they were right. like, you better not evict that bird. And it was, you know. For those who don't know, this is a red tail hawk that's living on Fifth Avenue and 72nd Street, looking over Central Park for <laughs> free, you know, like just like just like this great gift and was dropping rat carcasses right. on the <laughs> lobby floor <laughs> and, and also attracting people across the street with telephoto lenses looking exactly, into like yeah, yeah. where Mary Tyler Moore lived. Yeah. So they evicted it and then there was this big, you know, hullabaloo and has been reinstated. That, that hawk has also been tremendously successful and has lived twice as long as hawks are supposed to and live. And breeding yeah, too. It's yeah, it's on its eighth mate right now. Just, just say it very quickly. The apartment building next to Mary Tyler Moore's and the and Pale Mail was Woody Allen, who was out there, oh, <laughs> lived okay. there, yeah, out there with his binoculars yeah. all the time. And we were thrilled to see him come out. <laughs> yeah. and okay. Well, and the, the guy who does the parrots in Greenwood Cemetery. <laughs> He got into like, birds in New York because he got involved with pale mail. So like all of these stories like led me to another one. You good. talk to someone about parrots, like you got to see about this hawk. You talk to someone about shipworms, they say you got to talk about, you know, like it really, one thing really did. Yeah, I'm glad about. that's in a book. Yeah, thank yeah, you. For sure. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take another online question. It relates to the tiger. How come nobody heard the tiger roar? And also what happened to the cat? Oh, the cat. Oh, the cat. I, know, I, I feel like the cat didn't die that day, but <laughs> is maybe no longer with us. Uh, it's one of these things where everybody, after it got found out, and it was, you know, this was a big story locally, the Tiger Man. And, you know, it was like, oh, I always knew. You know, it was one of those things, oh, I always knew. But he, by his account, was in that apartment with that tiger 24 hours a day you know, playing and like, so the, the tiger wasn't, he said he left for one hour uh, a week on Sunday to buy raw meat for the tiger. <laughs> what else? And they, oh, and, they, and they both fasted, they both fasted on Sunday. Incredible. Yeah, so I, I, I think the tiger was, again, this was not a, an endorsement of keeping a tiger in your apartment, <laughs> but he seemed to do well at that, you know, until he didn't and, uh, and things went poorly. In your book, one of the quotes I remember verbatim is you call this a spectacularly bad idea. Yeah, I was sort of like being sympathetic to him, but I was like, to be clear, this is a spectacularly bad idea. I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression. Um, right. Um, yes, I'll take you, sir. Hey, Bill. Hi, Mike. Uh, how many years pre-digitized newspapers, were you on the trail of alligators in the sewer? Uh, so let me get some clarification. You wanna know how far back I went in, in the... Uh, 
Yeah. So I, I mean, I, yeah. So I, I would say I did a, a very superficial dive when the 75th anniversary came around. Uh, Cause I thought just, this is like, okay, this is it. Let's celebrate it. And so I didn't really do a, a deep dive into research until a number of years later, I would say I, I, I did my deepest dive maybe about four or five years ago. And that's when I turned up these many articles that I, turned, that I mentioned here. Um, and then, uh, and I have to say, so the highlight of that discovery process, of course, was finding the daily news yeah. photo, which I think is, I, I like to think is my discovery. I mean, it was there, it was, it was hiding in plain sight. And it really, it really put to bed that, that aching tiny little suspicion that maybe this really didn't happen. And this was a hoax. This was a-, a, a, a When did you a, find was, that? That was, that was about four or five years ago. Okay. Uh, the, yeah. the, the photo. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, um, and, and, uh, and I have a feeling that that was, a, that, that was made possible only recently because the daily news was scanned and put on, was made available. Right. Uh, because I'm not going to go there with microfilm right, right. in the library. I'm not going to go yeah. turning the pages. Uh, so I, I did a deep online research dive and discovered that and many of the other things I talked about. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, an online question from Nancy. I noticed that many of the animals in my local park, Fort Tyron Park, were friendlier or maybe even bolder during lockdown. Could it have been the quieter environment of many fewer cars and machines in general? Uh, you know, possibly. I think that the rats actually did the best with the lockdown. I think they did. They, that's my theory is that they thrived the most and that nature is healing thing. Uh, because we stopped collecting uh, organic waste and recycling organic waste. So we left more food on the street uh, by, by the order of something like 50,000 extra tons a year uh, as a budget cut due to the pandemic. Uh, the sanitation department stopped picking up organic recycling. And so that is a buffet. So that led, in my opinion, to more rats. Uh, but um, I don't know. I feel like there was like people got out pretty quickly, uh, at, you know, after the first couple of weeks and things sort of returned to normal pretty quickly. Well, I'm just going to follow up with a comment from the uh, audience. This is um, from an online audience, because this is very apropos. Steve online believes that rats have got a bad rap be because at one, that's rap, not rat, but at one time they were considered to be a symbol of industriousness and are actually carved over one of the GST entrances. I'm not sure what GST stands Grand for. But, sorry? Grand Central Terminal. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay. okay. Yeah. So well, I, I, well, my whole opinion on rats is that we a feed them and then are like, where are all these rats coming from? <laughs> like we've done nothing and nothing works. It's like, you're not going to build a bigger rat trap. You need to cut off their food source. But we, the things that we don't like about rats could kind of be said about us. We're like, oh, there's too many of them. They, they're, they're leaving a mess. They consume too much. They're filthy. And it's like, that's kind of what we do too. You know? So I, I, I think they're very smart, uh, clever animals, you know, loads of medical breakthroughs have been made uh, not uh, maybe against the rat's wishes but um <laughs> I, I, there, you know the pizza rat is mentioned in the book that wasn't a naturally occurring thing but a rat was trained to do that which is kind of remarkable that you could train a rat to do that having said all that where i think pigeons can provide this great uh ecological niche we don't need the rats and we don't need the roaches either. I don't think. Yeah. There's not like a, here, 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 yeah, but, yeah. but very nice in defense of the rats. Sure. Okay. I will take an online uh, question. I mean, sorry, I will take an in-person question. question. No, I'll say one last thing while we're walking around about the rats is that when we poison rats, we poison red tail hawks and we poison the barred owl in Central Park that was hit by a car, but was, was also totally, you know, full of rat poison. So well, we live in Red Hook where there's a fair variety of animals, but I was very surprised in the last couple of years to encounter skunks. Oh. And it turns out we have quite a skunk population over oh, wow. there. Is that unusual? Uh, it's, it is, I think. Uh, I, I know that one was spotted in Prospect Park recently for the first time in a great long while. And an Eastern Cottontail is another one that was spotted in Central Park for the first time in a great long while, but um, I'm not surprised. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that about the Red Hook skunks. 
about the bees? The oh, bees? the red, the red hook bees. Yes. Yes. And I did. There's details that I left out because it's a it's a crazy story. And I went in another direction. But you, in, in short, bees are responsible for the largest marijuana bust in New York City history. They uncovered the largest known marijuana growing facility, uh, a couple of football fields in Red Hook underneath the Maraschano cherry factory. The bees had gone there and come back to their hive <clears throat> and the honey was bright red. The EPA said that's the same dye as cherries. They said, we're gonna go do an inspection at this cherry factory. The DEA said, we'd like to come with you actually. <laughs> and they uncovered in the basement huge fields of marijuana uh and it's it, it's there's there's a lot of interesting things that are happening with bees in new york city and they're a great addition and uh but yeah that's that that particular the red hook bee story is its own book really and there's it's a, it's a hell of a story karen i'm gonna take a host prerogative here because i have a question sure okay something i learned from your book thank the skunk the skunk question reminded me of this question i have for you so i learned from your book that raccoons have opposable thumbs. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, if raccoons crossbreed with dolphins, are our species doomed? We're doomed. Right. We're doomed. <laughs> we're doomed. I mean, <laughs> actually, there was something in your presentation about how these animals got to places, and I did my own like New York Times research. I just put in the, the animal name and saw the first couple mentions I could get to give myself a little context. And one theory about raccoons in New York is that logging industry. Uh, would bring the raccoons with the timber to New York City. Not that they were naturally occurring, but of course they are naturally occurring okay. animals here. But but I thought opposable thumbs was just a, was strictly a primate thing. Uh, they're they're called pri they they have su maybe they're not see okay yeah, so the but they, pandas have fake opposable. It could thumbs. be a fake opposable. Yeah, thumb so it's thing, not yeah. a real thumb thumb. Yeah. It's it's some sort of. Uh, uh, um, but they so, wash their food like they can, yeah, 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 yeah 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 yeah. But and they're I, highly okay. intelligent. As All right, well. you'll, you'll check that yeah, out for, will, for, for, for the second edition. <laughs> okay, yeah. but yeah, you got me scared there. All right. Yeah, the, the raccoons are yeah. Karen. Right. Okay, I'm going to take um, uh, an online uh, question. And then we'll take one more from the audience and then that will wrap. I know we could all probably stay here all night. There's probably so many questions, but we will do it. Okay, so um, one, actually, Michael, this is a comment. I'm just going to tell you, this is from Miss Maya. She says, there used to be alligator art on the walls of the tunnel connecting the 14th Street, 127 7th Avenue station to 14th and 6th, and now they're gone. Oh. Did you know that? I, I knew about, I remember seeing, I don't remember exactly where, I remember seeing alligator murals, you know, the, 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 the art in the subway program is very, you know, is very whimsical and very historical. So uh, I remember having seen them and that the fact that they're gone, uh, well, do you have any insights well, about that? Uh, two blocks west at 14th and 8th Street at the AC and L. Are the statues right? The, the Tom Modernists, right? What, and there's there's but they're not a mural. It's but right. It's this, just... this is in the tunnel. She said, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, on the tunnel. Yeah, I think sure. I remember seeing okay. you know like little little tiled alligators walking along the edges of some of these tunnels. I don't have. It's it's. I don't know what became of them. <laughs> well, anyway, that. Maya suggests petition to bring them back in honor <laughs> of the book. It, and the wonderful lecture. So that's it. Okay. Okay. So this I would will sign be that. <laughs> right. Okay. And so this this will be the last online question. Uh, this is uh, for Bernice. I love animals, especially sheep. Is there a sheep story there, in your book? And is. thank you for a great presentation. They're uh, they're the worker animals. They're the original Parks Department landscapers, uh, Prospect Park and Central Park, and they were brought back to the old St. Patrick's Cathedral. In the last 10 years in Soho, basically. Oh. There are three uh, sheep from upstate that graze during the San Gennaro Festival, I think. Around, in August and September, you can find three sheep grazing in a back, in the, I guess, the graveyard at the old St. Patrick's Cathedral. Wow. Yeah, I think on Elizabeth Street, maybe. So many unknown facts. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take the last question from the audience. Do we have a uh... Do we have a question? There we go. Um, Just about every year we hear about a black bear being found in the suburbs of Pennsylvania or in wow. New Jersey. Um, are there any black bear stories? Or are we likely to get a black bear in the future? On Wall Street? Yeah, Wall Street, <laughs> yeah, the bears and the bulls, right? Um, 
No, uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that's the coyote's success is that there are no more bears uh, nearby. And that's the deer success too, which is its own real problem in places like Staten Island is that there's no natural predator for these animals. Um, and one thing I did, this not, I didn't have enough to, to include in a chapter, but there was a panther spotted in Manhattan in like 1680 or something. It's nice. the only known sighting. I couldn't find another word about it, but okay, yeah, as far as yeah. predators in and the city. I, I think historically speaking, I think bears were used to entertain and to fight basically okay. dogs versus bears oh my God. in the early, yeah, it was yeah. a pretty savage kind of yeah. thing. Uh, back in you know in the seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds in New York City, but they were not natural. Sure, like, naturally occurring. Sure. All right, Karen, I think we're done. Thank, Thank you so much. That was great. That was great. All right. So, uh, you folks at home, I hope you've enjoyed this. But you're not going to be able to indulge uh, like the folks who are here in person. Those of you who are here in person. Uh, you, we each have, we have for each of you a little souvenir gift, right? That will not become burdensome and live in your bathtub and <laughs> just, you'll, you'll have to bring the to the courts, yeah, yeah. Uh, flush down the toilet. So it's a little plastic alligator. This is a tradition I've had since I've started celebrating alligator in sewer day. So by all means, take one and only one, please. <laughs> uh, if you haven't already taken one. And if you have a kid at home or a niece or a nephew, you want to take another, that's fine. But please don't stuff your pockets, okay? Uh, uh, and we also will be offering books for sale. Uh, Tom will be at the back of the room signing books and selling books. Um, so thank you. Thank you. This thank was you. great. Thank Tom. you all for being here. This was awesome. Thank it was so awesome. Much. It was great. It was just been such a pleasure to have you both, as I was about to say. Um, it's also wonderful to have a light-hearted topic yes. to begin the lecture series. You were both so splendid. We're so in such gra gratitude uh, to Michael for putting the program together, for commemorating, uh, you know, critters in the sewer <laughs> day, and and what and what an absolute pleasure uh, to have Tom here tonight to talk about his book. And you know, Tom told me something at the at the beginning of the evening. Um, this, I believe, is his twenty fifth talk, but this is the first one in person that's right. so that's it. yeah yeah fantastic yeah good to see you all yeah yeah Be like it. and i want to reinforce that his wonderful book with the most gorgeous illustrations fantastic copy will be for sale as michael just said and now to just say a few more things as victoria dengel our executive director and we want to get on to the book signing, so I don't want to keep you too long, but just to say, Tom, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And thank you for loving the library on your first visit. <laughs> and that works out well because we do make all of our lecturers uh, lifetime members of the oh library. That's so, so amazing. Thank so, you. So, I'll be and, back. <laughs> we look at, and, and bring your family yeah. back. And to Michael, you're such a friend to the General Society. Thank you. You are a friend to me. Yeah, thank you. We love having you. And, and thank you for making it so entertaining. And uh, to our audience who's with us tonight, it's so good to see you. We love you all. We really do. We're so happy when you're here. And to our at-home audience, we look forward to seeing you in the very near future because we really love our in-person, <laughs> if I haven't made that clear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we have a little memento for you both from tonight. Yes. So just a, a, a poster, a little memory. Um, Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, the audience, uh, for being here in person. I also want to thank our online audience. Um, as I said, the in-person audience will have an opportunity to purchase this book, and we'll, I'll also send you the online link when I send out the video link. Uh, finally, I'm just going to mention two upcoming lectures, um, Understanding the History and Impact of uh, Gustavino Through Five Decades of Construction at the Cathedral Church of St. John Divine. That's Tuesday, April 12th. And on Tuesday, April 19th, we have from England, um, Tessa Murdoch, who will be speaking about in Europe divided Huguenot refugee art and culture as you see we have radically different topics we do hope to see we do hope to see you come back again many many thanks to Michael and Tom thank you all for coming thank you, thank you. So